we're always going to have problems in life. Learning to live well is accepting that we are going to have problems and face challenges, but that we'll often come out on the other side of them better if we accept that and act accordingly. Michael Easter, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Me too, man. Why are you interested in discomfort? Seems like a weird thing to be interested in. I guess it, yeah, it kind of is. Um, so my background is I've been a health and performance journalist my entire career. So I worked at Men's Health for a pretty long time in the U.S. And um, pretty early in my career, I noticed that everything that I was writing about in terms of lifestyle health and how to improve your health, I usually had to go through some form of discomfort to see a benefit. So if I want to improve my fitness, I have to work out. Working out sucks, right? If I want to lose weight, probably going to have to eat less. I'm going to be hungry. Being hungry sucks. Even mental health, proving your mental health, right? You usually have to unpeel some sort of psychological onion and get to the bottom of what is causing this issue, right? And that can often be uncomfortable. So I noticed that. And then I just had a handful of events in my life that really sort of cemented that concept. And yeah, that led me to ultimately write The Comfort Crisis. You went on an experience to the Arctic with a friend of yours. And that was one of the big parts of this. Yeah, I did. So the guy's name is Donnie Vincent and he is a backcountry bow hunter and filmmaker. Um, <clears throat> he makes these movies that I like to describe as planet earth, but with hunting. So they're not like your typical, you well, know, it's like the opposite of, of planet earth. David Attenborough being very gentle with some monkeys <laughs> in a forest. Here's some guy stood next to a huge deer that he's just shot with a bow. Yeah, well, it, it's almost like it's got the same vibe, and then all of a sudden it's like, Death. Oh, we we killed the animal. Yeah, <laughs> um, no, yeah. they're they're really interesting though, and I think that what's important about him is he's really changing how hunting is perceived and how it's practiced. He's kind of at the forefront of this movement um, that's really changing hunting. So I met him through doing a story about him in Men's Health a handful. It was maybe five six years ago. And we just stayed in touch, right? And the story was super popular in men's health. We stayed in touch and he calls me up one day and he goes, hey, I'm going up to the Arctic for more than a month. Do you want to come along? And, you know, my initial reaction is, uh, hell no, <laughs> but he's a good salesman. He gets in on this sales pitch, right? He's like, dude, it's going to be the most epic adventure you could ever be on. We're going to see grizzly bears, packs of wolves. We're going to climb ancient mountains and cross glacial rivers and on and on and on, right? And I live in Las Vegas and I'm at home sitting on the couch in my air-conditioned home, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that sounds like me, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I sign on and uh, yeah, I start training. I get my plane tickets up there. I have to totally like overhaul how I'm living to get uh, prepared for a journey like that. And we ended up spending more than a month up in the Arctic on this pretty epic uh, backcountry hunt. So we were, you know, hundreds of miles from other people. I mean, middle of nowhere. It's like middle of nowhere. And uh, it was uncomfortable. And I think, you know, what I, what I drew from that is um, we have, we as humans have really engineered uh, comfort into our lives in so many different ways. I mean, I think that there's ways that are uh, quite obviously graspable. So the fact that we don't really need to put physical effort in to live anymore, right? Like you could have 1,000 steps a day and be fine, right? Would not have been possible 1,000 years ago because you're having to hunt and gather for your food, or whatever it might be. Um, we, live in we live at 72 degrees now. Right. We have food that is easily accessible. We don't necessarily have to work for it. But we've even put in things like, you know, people tend to feel uncomfortable in silence. Well, today we've like raised the the um, loudness of the world like fourfold and on and on and on. So in the book, I really single out these what I consider really important forms of discomfort um, that we evolved to face that naturally kind of keep us healthy that we have engineered out of our lives. What was the scariest or most uncomfortable part of the trip that you took up to the Arctic? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So I think that what's interesting is that <clears throat> when I talk about grizzly bears, people are always like, oh, my God, grizzly bears. Like everyone wants to know about grizzly bears. You look at the you look at the numbers. It's like the crappy little planes you have to fly to get out there. I mean, they're like these two seaters. They're packed, the size of a pack of gum. They crash all the time. Like statistically, that's way more likely to kill you. That and the weather, right? So 
probably the most dangerous thing we did was taking the planes in. I was going to say the most dangerous part of the trip was getting there. Yeah, it was getting there. <laughs> um, but then we also had some pretty gnarly weather a couple times. We almost lost our shelter one night. There was like this hurricane force winds that were threatening to just like blow our shelter into Russia more or less. And rule number one of surviving out in the wild is making sure that you have a shelter. Cause if you don't, you're exposed and it's easy to, uh, <laughs> yeah, find yourself in quite the pickle. So where were you on the Arctic? Cause obviously it's a big ring above. Yeah. What, were you, what were you directly above? Yeah. So we were in the Alaskan Arctic. We're about maybe 150 miles above the Arctic Circle. Pretty high then. Yeah, pretty high. There's a there's an area called the No Attack uh, National Preserve, which is where we were. What was the day and night cycles like based on the time of year you were there? Pretty long days. I think the sun would go down at maybe, I'm having trouble remembering, like maybe 10. And then it would, I don't know what time it got up because I was always so tired at the end of the day that I would just like, yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of sleep in and be up. But what was interesting is that we were so high that we were losing, I think it was like six or seven minutes every single day. So being up there for that long, it was like, you know, when we first got up there, the sun is going down at whatever it might be, 10, 11. By the time we left, it was, you know, much earlier in Moved just rapid. 30 days. Yeah. yeah. Have you read uh, Endurance by Alfred Lansing about Sir Ernest Shackleton's trip across the Antarctic? Have you ever read that? I haven't. Oddly enough, everyone recommends it to me. Um, it's on my list, but I haven't read it. No. Add, <laughs> add another person to the list of those that are annoying you about the fact that you need to read that. But Right on. Dude, hearing that, because they're out there for, I think, the best part of two years. Mm -hmm. And when you hear about just how savage those conditions are, you know, electing to go and do that, I suppose there is glory associated with it. But the glory of whatever it was, 1914, I think they left. They left like three days after World War I was announced. And what mm. happened was they sent a letter, maybe even to the king. I think Shackleton sent a letter to the king saying, I understand that I'm taking 20 good men of fighting age, some of whom have experience in war, uh, and on yomping to the other side of the planet to go and do this stupid thing. We'll stop all of it. We'll keep endurance in port, which was the name of the boat, and we will come back and fight. And they waited for a couple of days, and they just got a letter, that, a telegram that said go. So they got nice. to go, which is pretty dope. Um, yeah, But dude, cool. hearing what they had to put up with um, and the fact that you elected to do that is... Do you think... This is something I think about all the time. The difference between elected and unelected suffering or elected and unelected discomfort... You know, the difference between things being hard in life because you've elected to go and do a difficult CrossFit workout or things being hard in life because you've just snapped your Achilles. Totally. Um, you know, both of them are health uh, challenges, uh, physical, physical discomfort, um, but one of them you chose and the other one you didn't. And I'm quite, I'm quite interested in the difference between those two. I think a lot of the time people confuse one for the other people who are into um getting comfortable being uncomfortable training hard maybe brazilian jiu-jitsu or endurance running or crossfit or whatever um but speaking as someone that thought that he had uh, a good amount of resilience and then snapped an achilles two years ago it crosses over a little bit but it doesn't cross over that much and there's a big yeah. difference between those two so yeah, I'll answer that two ways. Um, <clears throat> first off, you have to realize it's like, why do we want to be comfortable in the first place? Why do humans tend to always do the next easiest thing? Right? It's because for millions of millions of years, we lived in these environments of discomfort where life was inherently hard, right? There was not enough food. We had to work for that food. There was danger. There was a lot of risks that were wired to avoid all risk. All right, so doing the, the least risky, easiest, most comfortable thing, that kept us alive, right? That gave us a survival advantage. Great. Well, recently, especially within the last 100 years, uh, our environments have tipped to those of comfort, where now it is very easy to just do the easiest thing, right? We've sort of engineered comfort into our lives. We still have this drive to do the next most easy thing. 
So I think that's why you, we need to consciously think about inserting discomfort back into our life, however that may be, right? So we choose to do a CrossFit workout and undergo that suffering as a replacement for the suffering we used to have in the past, <laughs> right? That now keeps us healthy and fights back against this environment we lived in, we now live in that's taken movement from our day, that's put a ton more food into our lives than we ever had before, right? So it's kind of an antidote. And then uh, the second part, the way I'll answer that is that when you look at the research on um, people who have faced trauma or hardship or challenge in their life, people who have faced a ton of that kind of stuff, they have a lot of mental health problems, okay? But at the same time, people who have not faced really any challenges or trauma, they have equally poor rates of mental health. So there is a sweet spot where you need enough challenge in your life, and this is stuff that is unplanned, um, but not too much. So part of it is finding that sweet spot. And I think that um, a lot of times what you find is that people in retrospect, so long as they haven't gone through complete hell, they look back and report, oh, that was actually a blessing because it led me to X, Y, Z. Now that could just be some weird quirk in the human brain. I don't really care what it is. I just care that it tends to make people more resilient. Yeah, whether you're post hocking it or not, if you come out the other side and you feel better, then it's like the it's like an experiential placebo pill, kind yes. of. And if it works, exactly. it works. I read a study a while ago that said 66% of people report post-traumatic growth rather than post-traumatic stress after going through something. Yeah. And I then read another study which refuted that, which is just like the problem of epistemics in uh, the 21st century, I suppose, that for every study that says something's good, there's another one that says <laughs> that that might be wrong. Uh, but from my own personal experience, absolutely. The times mm -hmm. when I've gone through something which has been unelected and difficult, um, maybe that's because I haven't crossed that threshold into something which would be uh, unrecoverably traumatic. Um, and that's what you're saying, kind of there is a sweet spot between the two. You know, some absolute catastrophe of losing your entire family in a plane crash or something is probably pushing it a little bit far. Yes. But, you know, snapping an Achilles or having to deal with being poor for a while or having to deal with, you know, losing a, a person that you really loved or whatever, you know, br difficult breakup and stuff like that. A lot of the time when you look back, those are the lessons that, expedited growth and really took you to the next level in life. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, a lot of it is how, you know, I think that between the event happening and the processing of it um, over the long run, there's often a choice, right? It's like, how am I going to, how am I going to frame this? Uh, and I think that just having the right mindset going through those kind of things can be the diff difference maker. And I, I, th I also think that, especially today, it's like we tend to over pathologize everything. <laughs> right? How do you mean? Well, something bad happened. So now it's a medical condition of trauma or PTSD. We're going to slap a label on it, right? When really it's like part of it is just being a human, right? Like, do people honestly expect that they're going to go through life without ever having problems? Like life is a video, like, you know, think of life as a video game. Are there any levels that are not hard? Like what if the level was just like nothing, right? It's like, we're always going to have problems in life. So like learning to live well is accepting that we are going to have problems and face challenges, um, but that will often come out on the other side of them better if we accept that and act accordingly. Dude, I love that. There's a Sam Harris video floating around from one of his new ones where he talks about exactly that. No, oh, interesting. Do you would you imagine that one day you would wake up and all of your problems would be gone, as if you'd got to a level in a computer game and there was nothing there? You'd be bored. You'd be bored out of your mind. Problems oh, totally. are not going to go away. The yeah. problem that you have is the way that you think about your problems, and you can drop your problems if only for a moment. If you can, and then you need to be enlightened and you need to identify the difference between the self and all yeah. that. But the principle of problems are there. They're an inherent part of life. They're a feature, not a bug. Right, and people treat them like bugs, not features. It's like, no, this is the this is why you're here. You were you're not here to lie in a pool with a cocktail for the rest right. of life. Um, and and part of what I talk about in the book, I talk about this um, 
concept called prevalence induced concept change. Now that is a, a kind of a dorky way of basically talking about this concept called problem creep. And uh, it was discovered by some scientists at Harvard, uh, maybe in 2018, and basically found that as humans experience fewer and fewer problems, we don't actually perceive ourselves as having fewer problems because we just find the next problem. But what I'm talking about in the book is that as the world has gotten better and better and better, the problems that we then find become progressively more hollow. So this explains why we have first world problems, right? So you think about it, I, I think that we probably all agree that compared to, let's say, 300 years ago, 3,000 years ago, the world is better, right? We're less likely to go hungry. We're less likely to, you know, uh, toil in a field under a king who gives us like these meager rations. Uh, our kids are less likely to die at any given moment. But when you poll people, only 6% of Americans, at least, now we're pessimistic bastards, um, only 6% of people say that the world is improving. And it's because we're always moving the goalposts. We're always just searching for the next problem. And so I think when you apply that to daily life, it just totally messes with your perspective on things. Because you can either like kind of have these moments where you're just pissed off because like, oh, I, you know, I was late for my yoga class, right? Or you can be like, man, this is ridiculous that I'm living in temperature control and have access to food. Like, this is amazing. And I'm not saying the world doesn't have problems that we should solve, but like in the grand scheme of time and space, our problems now are you know, not that bad. Some of the bigger ones like global warming withstanding, I guess. Are you familiar with Parkinson's law? Do you know what that is? Mm -mm, I don't. Okay, okay so it's a, a law around productivity and it says work expands to fill the time given for it. So if you have three months to complete an assignment, the likelihood is that you are going to do the assignment 10 minutes before it's due to yeah. be in right that's why you hand, hand stuff in work expands to fill the time given for it. it's one of the reasons that time blocking as a productivity strategy is useful because you create time bounded constraints around different bits of work that you need to do i was talking to a philosopher friend last night on the phone who is uh, and i quote trying nihilism uh, as a life as a life philosophy <laughs> fucking hell and he was saying basically the same thing that ostensibly he has absolutely nothing wrong, um, but he believes that there is a uh, Parkinson's law equivalent of suffering. So suffering expands to fill the room given for it in life. If you don't have that many things going wrong, you just magnify in on things that are ever so slightly suboptimal until they become this huge big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's basically this idea that these Harvard researchers are talking about. And the, it's funny because the way that they went about studying this is there um, <clears throat> there's two of them. Uh, one of them's name is David Lavari. He was the main guy on the study. And the other was Daniel Gilbert, who's kind of a famous name in psychology. They're at an airport because they're traveling to a conference. Right. And they're in the line for TSA. And they make this observation about TSA. Uh, and that is that they are really good at finding problems, right? And we've, we've obviously experienced this in our life that, you know, when we go through security, it's like our bag gets ripped apart because the agent thought that this banana we had was like a nine millimeter Beretta, right? Uh, or there's like some old woman in front of us who's like 90, can't see, can't hear, can't walk. She's in a wheelchair. And they give her like the full body scan down because she's got like a half filled, you know, bottle of hairspray or whatever. So these guys wonder, it's like, okay, obviously better safe than sorry. But if all of a sudden everyone started abiding by the rules and like the scanners never picked anything up, uh, no buzzer, the buzzers never went off when you had to stand in that weird thing, they never caught anything. Would TSA just let everyone fly through? Like, oh yeah, have a good flight guys, have a good flight. And they didn't think so because the TSA's job is to search for problems, right? So they thought they'd probably just keep finding more um, flipping problems over time. So to study this, they get these groups of people and they have uh, the first group, uh, they look, have them look at 800 different faces. So the job of the participants is to look at face after face and basically deem whether they find this face threatening or non-threatening. Okay. So they're going like threatening, non-threatening, 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 ooh, threatening. Unbeknownst to the participants, after about the 200th face, they start showing them fewer and fewer and fewer threatening faces. Now, in the second study, same setup, except it was with research proposals, and they had to deem whether these research proposals were ethical or unethical. Same deal, 
after ha- midway through, they start giving them fewer and fewer unethical research proposals. So these things should, they should be black or white, right? Because like a face, I either find a person threatening or I don't. Some proposal either crosses this moral line I have in the sand or it doesn't, right? But what they found is that people actually see gray. So as people started to see fewer and fewer threatening faces, they started to deem ambiguous faces as threatening. They said the same, they said threatening the same number of times, right? Same with the research proposals. They started looking at these research proposals that were kind of like pretty ambiguous as being unethical. So that's basically how they found that as people experience fewer problems in our lives, we don't actually experience fewer problems. We just look for more problems and deem things that are probably not problematic as problems. I notice this when I'm at work. So I run nightlife events and a lot of the time the door staff will be just checking IDs, very, very similar to the TSA thing. And there'll be someone that will come up who is exactly the same as the last 10 people. They say their date of birth. It looks like them. But then they'll they'll feel like there's an obligation for scrutiny because whatever the scrutiny alarm hasn't gone off sufficiently for the last 10 people uh can you give me your address and your postcode okay what's your postcode backwards okay can you what's your uh fucking star sign they love that one like what's your star sign oh yeah because that's going to rumble this 17 year old that's using an 18 year old's id to try and get in but another thing that i find that i think this shows up in is when you have let's say that people are at work um and there is a team of people that are working a lot of the time if you're in a meeting people will feel the need to contribute things that don't actually have to be said. So let's say that the desi- a design that gets put forward for a piece of artwork and everybody's happy with it, but there is a sense that, well, I'm here to make some sort of a contribution. You go, well, what, 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 about, what, about if we, what about if we move the image? Not much, but you know, just a little bit. And it's this compulsion to, to try and find a way to contribute as well. And I think that you see that in in work settings. I know that I do it. So again, if I'm stood outside of a nightclub and the queue is absolutely fine, nothing wrong at all, but I'll walk down and I'll just move the barriers in. Barriers creep out in nightlife a lot and the goal is to keep them as tight to the wall as possible. Uh, and I'll just move them a foot, half a foot, like six inches, these barriers. They're several yards wide. And I'll just go and give them a little nudge because I'm like, oh yeah, that's fucking helped. That's made a really big difference to this queue of 418 year olds who are all drunk that half foot that i've just moved the barriers in but you do it because you you try and i I think it it comes from most of the time or a lot of the time it comes from a virtuous place the tsa agents are doing it because they want to try and catch the crims right they want to make sure that people are safe on the but yeah there's definitely a sense that people just do shit they feel like they should be doing shit (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Um, the, yeah, there's actually some research around this. And the reason for this is that um, humans evolved to basically want to feel like they're being useful contributors to their environment. And this is not only internally, but also more importantly, um, so we can s- show socially that we're doing something and contributing to the tribe. Because if we're standing there and like just not doing anything because we're consciously going like, yeah, I think things are pretty good. You know, but everyone else is working. Well, if we don't work, it's like, well, get the hell out of the tribe, dude. Right. And then you're on your own. You're going to get thrashed by wolves or whatever. And I love that story you told about nightlife. And I would I would see it in my own work. Like when I was uh, working at Men's Health Magazine, we would do these things called wall walks and we would get every single article that was going to be in the magazine, including the cover. And we would go um, we would go over what the headline was going to be. And it was literally like, you know, someone would throw out a really good idea. But one person would be like, eh, I don't know that. I don't, I don't know. And then we'd have to like go on to another one. And these would take hours and hours and hours. Right now, before these started happening, which is hilarious is that there was this, uh, there was this guy who ran the magazine and he and the number two at the magazine would just go to a bar and they would sit down with the entire magazine and they would do this themselves. And at that point, the magazine was selling way more. Right. So it's like, here we have this massive group of people all spending time on this little thing, just being like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And then these two guys would just do the same damn thing, but arguably a lot more efficiently. And I think that that's sort of a good lesson too, for creative work. It's like, we know feedback is really important, 
but do we need feedback from 10 people? Because it's like just so much noise, right? Where it's like, if you just can find one person that you really trust and you're like, this is my dude or my girl, whatever. Uh, I think that can uh, arguably be a lot more efficient. There is a non-zero chance that somebody is going to feel a compulsion to contribute because of this, whatever, uh, contribution compulsion, that's what we'll call it. Uh, <laughs> I like it. Um, there is a non-zero chance that that's going to do it. And for every person that you add into the group, that increases. Yes, The chance totally. that that's going to happen increases. Whereas if it's two people, you know, you can just, is it fine? Yeah, it's fine, 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 fine. Uh, all right, have a chat between two people. Fine, fine, fine. Yeah, absolutely, man. When we're doing artwork amends, one of the worst things that we can do. So we uh, we have a new DJ that's coming to play or someone's featuring or it's a Valentine's traffic light party or whatever. And we put our video. This is the worst one. Fuck. We put a video into the group, right, with the boys and, and the, the managers. Throw it in. Guys, what do you think about this? And it's just a litany of problems they've got that that song's not cool anymore no one listens to that that was big on tiktok four months ago the i don't like the color of the font i don't like the this that and the other but if you sat down with each of the boys individually and showed them it they'd probably say that it was fine so another part of it is the signaling as well it's the signaling to the rest of the group i am somebody that looks at the work with such a high level of resolution that i'm picking up the things that you're not and that's such a I see it myself. I do it as well. I want to show off that, oh, actually, maybe maybe the alignment could be a bit better on this. I'm like, should It's fine. It's fucking fine. People are going to be looking at it half cut at pre-drinks when they're deciding yeah, right. where they're going to go out in a small window on the bottom corner of something. Like, it's it's going on Instagram. This isn't, it's not the ending of a Christopher Nolan movie. Yeah, totally. And I think it's like, it's a balance, right? It's like, you want a certain quality, but at the same time, I think we need to realize that, and I have the same problem, dude, like as a writer, I'll spend like two days on two paragraphs and I've got 85,000 words to write. Like that is not efficient at all. And I've had to stop myself from doing that. Like I'll have a, I'll just, I, I can recognize when I'm slipping into it and it's just like, dude, let it go. The average person is not going to know, is not going to notice anything. Right. And it's, yeah, I think it's a, definitely a tendency. <laughs> There's a quote from Tiago Forte that he tweeted a couple of years ago and it fuck, it's so mad. People put stuff out on Twitter that, you keep with you. Uh, most of Twitter is absolute horseshit, but every so often you find something yeah. like this. And he said, um, one of the interesting things about people who produce um, high leverage work is that their content has a rough edged, half assed quality to it because polishing things to perfection is a low leverage activity. Getting yeah. something to 93, 95% and just shipping it that's where most of the gains are accrued. Getting it from 95 to 100% in most areas of work makes no difference but the time sink you're talking about to get it from naught to 95 is one unit of time to get it from 95 to 100 is two units of time yes. okay you could have done two 95s in the time that it took you to do one 100 yeah and especially when we're talking about i mean i work in media so with content it's like people like to think they'll know what is going to do really well we have no freaking idea so no. is it better to put out like one 100 percent piece or three 95 percent pieces and see what happens because you i mean it's just more at bats right if you're hitting let's say you're hitting 300 well if you go to bat three times you're probably going to end up on base instead of if you just went to one i'm sorry i'm talking about baseball you guys don't give a shit about baseball but no, there's give, probably it, some, give us it in the cricket analogy that's all yeah, I there's probably know some about. cricket analogy out there <laughs> that's correct all right you looked at um rites of passage of one of these symbolic landmark experiences that some cultures put people through what do you learn there uh, so I started thinking about this cause I met this guy whose name is Marcus Elliott and there's, uh, two things you need to know about this guy is that one, he's kind of a seeker. What's so he lived mean? out of a, well, I'll tell you, oh. he lived out of a, he's kind of like, you know, he's open to experiences. He's kind of out there. So we lived out of a VW van for a while, uh, got through college by counting cards at casinos. He was going to burning man, like way back in the day. And the second thing you need to know about this guy is that he's super brilliant. So he gets his MD from Harvard Medical School and he decides, I don't want to be a doctor. I want to revolutionize sports science, which is a declaration that is like so grand that it's almost bordering on arrogance, right? (laughs) Uh, But he actually ends up doing it. So he's the first guy who really brought in like quantification of um, human movement and performance. So he can help. uh, He analyzes uh, athlete 
movement using all this high tech stuff. And then he can sort of say, Hey, here's what you're really good at. We need to develop that. And also like, here's where you have this injury risk. And when we see people move like that, they have a, let's say 60% chance of tearing their ACL or something in a season. So I told you that to basically tell you that, uh, he's all into numbers and data and figures, right? But he also realizes that what improves human performance, not just of athletes, of of also of the average person that can always be measured, right? There are certain qualities that people have that you just can't measure that makes them able to do more than other people, right? So to get to that, he does this thing that he calls uh, Masogi. And Masogi is essentially a recreation of these rites of passage that we used to have in, in the past that all cultures would send people out on. So the idea is that you're going to go out into nature and you're going to do something really, really freaking hard. And it's got to be hard enough that you're going to face this moment where you're like, man, I don't think I can complete whatever this task I'm trying to complete is. But by continuing on, you can get, reach this point where you've thought you reached your edge, but you're past it. And you can kind of look back and go, well, I thought I was past my edge, but here I am past it, right? So I've clearly undersold myself in this area of my life, which raises this question of like, where else have I sold myself short, right? So it kind of helps people expand their potential and teaches people what they're truly capable of. And it's also good at reframing fear because if you're doing something really hard and you're going to be afraid of failure, we're all wired to be afraid of failure. By sort of dancing on that edge, you can kind of see like, man, yeah, failure's not really that big of a deal. And so, yeah, again, it's like this recreation of these rites of passage that we used to face all the time that all cultures had. What are some examples of the rites of passage that his athletes have done? Um, so he's done one where they do one every year. So one, they got an 85 pound boulder and they walked it, I think five miles underneath the Santa Barbara channel, which is like about 10 feet deep. So one person would dive down, pick up the rock, walk this thing underwater, 10 yards, come back up. The next guy would go down on and on and on till this rock was at point B, right? They've done ones that are a lot simpler where it's like, we can see this mountain way off in the distance. Let's see if we can get to the top of it in 24 hours or whatever it might be. Uh, they stand up panel paddle boarded across the channel once, and they hadn't really done much stand up paddle boarding. So the, the point is that it doesn't really matter how grand it is for the average person. There just has to be a real 50, 50 shot of you accomplishing it. So like my 50% is going to be different than your 50% is going to be different than your 50%. You know, it's like if you've only run say 10 miles in your life, and you ask yourself, could I run 15? And you go, I probably could. Like, well, could you run 20? And you're like, oh, I don't know if I could run 20. Well, go find out. <laughs> right? You're going to hit a moment where you're like, God, I really want to quit. But by not quitting, you're really going to learn something about yourself and be able to take those lessons back into your normal life. It sounds like your sports science friend was doing that as part of a group. It seems like it was a team bonding experience as well. Is there yeah. something to learn from doing it on your own versus doing it as part of a group? I think that if you do it as a group, you have to all be relatively equally skilled because of that 50% thing. Like if you've got someone who's just a stud and then someone who like hasn't, you know, has been on the couch for the last five years, there's going to be a sort of someone's either going to make it really easy or it's going to be really hard for that other person. Um, Marcus has done them both alone and with people. So I think, you know, if you have a good group, totally try it. I have a friend who uh, box jumped Mount Everest. So he oh, did God. in, I think it took about, it took less than a day to do. So it's uh, Jay Alderton who has done a bunch of other shit. What the fuck else did he do? He did something else mental. The box jump was the most recent one, but he holds a couple of Guinness World Records. Uh, it used to be in some sort of armed forces. Okay. Then became a uh, champion like bodybuilding type dude, like fitness model type guy, and then decided to do these ridiculous, but yeah, box jumped Mount Everest. Wow. Well, Cameron How Haynes is- Did they explode at the end? He was good. So I think he, um, the form, his form was pretty good, but he was permitted to do, it's a 24 inch box, I want to say, so a standard, standard box jump height, but he was doing some smart things. He had knee wraps on. Um, he was stepping down from the box, so there was no fear about reba rebounding. Um, yeah. I think he was landing landing fairly soft and he was allowed to put his hands on his knees if he wanted to. And I don't know whether he had to reach like triple extension at the top either. I think he just had to get to the top of the box. Yeah. 
which you know all of these things are they're small but when you're doing it 20,000 times or whatever it was throughout a day um yeah, it would be like 15,000 box jumps if you do the math. Yeah, something it's like 24 that. 24 inches, yeah. Yeah, something it's like crazy. that. Uh, well, I mean, Cameron Haynes' son just beat David Goggins' uh, pull-up record in 24 hours, didn't he? I think so. Um, I saw him on a hunting trip in September, and he's it's very impressive because he's he's a big dude, too. Like, you know, I would imagine pull-up people being like, pretty small gymnast types but he's like he's a big dude so it's pretty impressive yeah what um is there something with this rite of passage that people are supposed to do to add some sense of sacredness to it either in advance or afterward um i think the sacredness happens in those moments where you think hard (laughs) yeah where you're like no i got i gotta quit but then you don't quit i mean i've done so i've started doing something like this every year and um it totally is where you're like, nope, can't finish this. But for whatever reason, you just kind of keep going and it's like, oh, holy shit. You know, I think that's when it really sets in. What was your one last year? Um, I've done some, I did a running one last year. So I'd only run uh, 16 miles. The, the farthest I'd run at one time was 16 miles and I did like 50. So, shit. Yeah, it was, yeah, I think it was at maybe mile like 35 that I was just like, yeah, I got to quit. No way. (laughs) And then I just kind of kept going and something kicks in at like mile 40 where it's just like, you know, you're in. And one of the, one of the things too, that, um, I talk about in the book is I'm kind of breaking this rule, but in the interest of getting it out to people is that you're not supposed to advertise this a ton, right? Because a lot of what we do in modern life now, especially, physically is just so we can put it on the gram for likes, right? We're not doing it for ourselves. And this really is something that you are supposed to do for yourself. So one of the guidelines is like, you know, you can talk about it with friends and stuff, but it's, this is not like I did it for the gram. It's not social media flex. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. One of the problems that you have, that's great. And I I really like that idea that the, that's sacredness as well, right? Doing it for its own sake. Um, however, I don't know whether you've seen 75 hard, which is a challenge that a lot of people are doing at the moment. It's just like... Yeah, a lot of people are doing that. It's a water, two 45-minute workouts, read 10 pages of a nonfiction book, stick to a diet, something like that, right? It's just a simple, here is the basics for nutrition, training, bit of mental health, and you're sleeping well, something like that. Yeah. Those sorts of movements, I think you're going to see those increasingly kind of like social-powered, simple stoic-esque all-encompassing lifestyle changes Um, and something like this you know if you were to do an equivalent of sober october which was it was and still is quite big or dry january if you were able to do something like that um i think that you would get a lot of people bought into this idea but it's inherently self-defeating because the advertisement of it i suppose there would be a way to say look um you can do this as a part of it and almost have the fact that you're not supposed to advertise it as one of the elements that you know you do you do this maybe you could follow the page or you know be a part of the group or whatever and you would maybe be able to speak to the those people that were within it but outside of that you don't you don't talk about it yeah i think i mean yeah i think you make a really great point i think it could potentially be a closed group or it's just like hey i'm doing this here was my experience um and maybe you just talk about it more vague you know um You know, it's like the Fight Club rule. You don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> Have you seen the Liver King on Instagram? Dude, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, he seems like a guy that, depending on how legit or not you think he is, but he seems like a guy that's trying to add discomfort into his life as much as possible. Yeah, for sure. For sure. He's a, he's an interesting cat. Someone uh, I had never heard of him. And one of my friends texted me about him and was like, dude, you got to see this guy. Um, I think it was more just based on the fact that he's eating so much raw meat, which I think, um, you know, I, I, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you don't know what to say. I think it would be cool. I, I've I'm in contact with his team about podcasts and stuff, but yeah, I haven't really heard anybody go deep. There's not been a, you know, men's health article yeah. written on him yet or any of that sort of stuff and um that yeah that mystique kind of adds a little bit i it wouldn't surprise me if you see him on something like a, a rogan at some point soon um yeah. just because he's so he, he's very intriguing you know say what you want about him like he's an intriguing guy that's uh, how yeah that's totally how i feel i'm like would i do a lot of the things that he does <laughs> no <laughs> hell no 
Um, I think that there's always like, especially with people on the extremes, I think it's relatively fair to say that he's at an extreme. I think there's a nugget of utility in, in what they're doing. I mean, I don't think it's irrational to say that like, yeah, but like organ meats are good for people, right? It's something we don't eat anymore. And we know that it has, it's more nutrient dense than a lot of the cuts that we eat now. Good advice. Is eating it at the expense of everything else good advice? I, I don't know. I'm not, you know I, I'm not a PhD holding nutritionist, but I talk to a lot and I, they might push back on that. But, you know, whatever. Go on Rogan, Brian. That's what we want. Uh, talk yeah, exactly. to me about the guy that fixed the Patriots. Oh, that was Marcus. Oh, that was the dude. That was your yeah. same guy. So was that the Patriots that he's got doing these crazy things? So he um, <clears throat> he worked with the Patriots. That was his first job out of college, uh, out of medical school. So he worked for them. I can't remember how many years, but he was there when they were winning some Super Bowls. One of the main things he did is that they had, I think it was like 26 hamstring injuries in a season. And he was able to drop that number down to three, right? So that that really helped them. So now he's got contracts with the NBA. Um, he works with some NFL teams. He works with MLB people. He works with some world soccer, NASCAR. And yeah, what he does is he basically, he doesn't make anyone do a Masogi because it's totally an elected thing, right? But he tells all his athletes to come through about it and some of them do it with him. And he does say too, he says, uh, there are people who hear about it and they go, no, I'm not doing that. Like, hell no. He's like, the people who are like, yeah, I'll do that. And end up doing it. He's like, those are the dudes that like have it, have that extra element. Like at the end of the game, you give them the ball type people. There's just, you know, something about them. Like if someone says they'll do that with me, I'm like, that person's going to be fine in their career. So what, what did he have anything to say if you fail your Masogi? Because obviously, you know, if there's a 50% chance of you failing it, yeah, then a, a good group of people are, are not going to get this done, you know, feelings of disappointment or insufficiency might crop up if you do that. Did you have any insight around that? I think that there's still lessons there though, right? So he talked to, he talked to me about one where he was going to do a rim to rim to rim of the Grand Canyon. And um, so it's like 45 miles maybe, but it really what kills you is the elevation uh, change. It's, it's a lot, right? Because you start at like 8,000 feet and in just a handful of miles, you're down to 2,000 or like 1,000 feet or something. I mean, it's more than 20,000 20, feet of elevation change. Easy. Well, more like 40, actually, if you do the math, because you're going down and then you're going back up. Um, and his knees just blew up on the way down. And so he got to the top of the north. He started the south rim, went down, went across the canyon bottom, went up, started to go back down. And it was just like, I'm going to have to get helicoptered out of here, you know? But he talked about how like that it, it's still an amazing lesson because there's so much adventure in that. And, you know, he was like, even though I had to stop, I was able to get farther than I anticipated once things started going south. Like it's still an amazing experience that you're going to learn from 50 50. You should like if you are doing something like this every year and you succeed, you're doing it wrong because there's so much in life now that we choose to do, but we know we're going to succeed. I mean, think of how people approach running a marathon. They don't go, I don't know if I can run a marathon. They say, I don't know if I can run a marathon in four hours or whatever some time goal is, right? We know we're going to be able to accomplish the things that we're going to try, but we just like set these kind of artificial time goals too. So one of the ideas here is like, I want a true 50-50 shot. Every other year, I should be failing more or less. You say that humans are wired to believe that we can that we're far less capable than we actually are as well. I suppose evolutionarily that makes sense. If you were this like hubris filled arsehole, you'd be dead within, you know, you wouldn't make it out of your the single digit years of your life. You'd have tried to, I don't know, tightrope walk across a branch over a lion's den. I said, Oh yeah, 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 I'll fine, I'll be sweet. And then yeah. you'd be very dead. Oh yeah, those genes would have died off, right? Whereas on the other on the other hand, if you're a person who's going, no, I'm not going to do that. Like that's ridiculous. But you get thrust into that situation, which used to happen to us all the time, right? But you're able to make it out, then that gives you a survival advantage. So we chronically undersell our potential, and there is a good reason for that. How can people push themselves emotionally or mentally? Uh, I think 
pairing the emotion and the, and the emotionally and physical stuff with what we're talking about uh, right now is important, right? But in terms of like relationships too, I think that dudes especially are just like freaking terrible with like opening up and honestly like having those conversations with a loved one or whatever you need to, you know, be open with people is just as tough sometimes for people as like doing this kind of physical stuff. It's like, I don't know, like I know plenty of people who could probably run a hundred miles right now. If you asked them, you'd be like, yeah, I got this right. But if you asked them to sit in silence alone with their own thoughts for five minutes, they would go absolutely bonkers. <laughs> so I do think it's important to think like, where, what am I bad at? Right. And sort of dive into that. So like for me, I've done these physical ones, right. But I haven't done like a real psychological one. So I'm thinking of doing some like extended meditation retreat or something just to see what the hell is going on up here that, you know, <laughs> meditation retreats, an awesome idea for uh, a ritual, you know, a yeah. rite of passage. Um, yeah. There's a, a concept I learned from Isaiah Berlin called the inner citadel. Have you heard of this? Mm -mm, I haven't. Dope, fucking dope insight. So um, when the world around us doesn't give us something that we want, a lot of the time we recede into ourselves, into this sort of walled off garden, a retreat into an existential inner citadel. So mm -hmm. one of the examples would be um, if you were in a war and your leg got wounded, you might try and treat the leg. And if you couldn't, you would chop the leg off and announce that the desire for legs is misguided and that nobody should have legs at all, and I never wanted legs in the first place. And you see this, it appears in tons of different areas, right? So uh, in the diet industry, you know, you have um, fat acceptance and body positivity, which is, I don't need to lose weight. The world needs to accept me at the weight that I am. Your conception about what an ideal body or your idea of fitness is, is inherently wrong. I'm fine as I are. Or another one that you see in relationships a lot is polyamory. You know, how many people are desiring to be polyamorous because that's their genuine compulsion and they believe in it, and how many of them just struggle to hold down a successful monogamous relationship so polyamory becomes their inner citadel and they retreat into this, right? They chop the leg off, announce that the desire for being single and monogamous is, is misguided. And this inner citadel thing comes up with what you're talking about, that you have people whose capacities may be totally extreme in one domain, just a freak, strength, endurance, some sort of physical attribute, but say, hey, man, would you go to uh, five sessions of counseling with your wife and sit down and genuinely go through the way that you feel? That's their, that's their citadel, right? They, they're going to retreat into where they find their comfort, which is the physical pursuit. Um, or for women, you know, the reverse might be true, or it might be something to do with body image, or it might be something to do with being disagreeable or being forthcoming, you know? Um, but yeah, that inner citadel thing appears fucking everywhere. No, I think you're absolutely right. And it, a lot of it too is, I mean, this is, I don't know if it's related, but it just made me think about it is <clears throat> sort of like a lot of people have unhealthy behaviors, but their unhealthy behaviors are things that society celebrates. So it's okay. Right. So if I, if I inject heroin or smoke weed every single day, I'm an addict. If I thrash myself in the gym, <laughs> I'm a hero. Right. But at the same time, it's like people use those behaviors because they don't want to deal. It's covering up some other thing that they don't want to deal with. So to your example about the person who can do all this crazy stuff in the gym but won't like have this conversation, it's like you're just compensating for this. Like you're using this as a tool to like deal with this other thing that you're not addressing, right? And it's just like what are people using to, to sort of deal with this larger problem? Um and there's a range of social acceptability. On Correct. What yeah, it, do, a right? lot of it's to do with the framing of how both you and other people see what you're doing. You know, it, I think that objectively you could say that the person who goes to the gym every night is uh, that in a citadel is generally more effective and beneficial for them and society at large than the person who decides to take heroin. Yes. However, mm -hmm. it doesn't stop the fact that the fundamental mechanism which both people are following, is one of escape. That yes. person is escaping from something. And I think that this is why you're seeing psychedelics amongst a particular group of people have such a, a, a 
renaissance so much popularity at the moment that it strips away your ability to hide from the things that you've been hiding from for a very long time totally yeah i think you nailed it you take a big gulp of ayahuasca and you hold it down for 30 minutes uh, you're you, you don't get to choose what you hide from you don't have your coping mechanism anymore you don't have the escape of crossfit or powerlifting or hill walking or bow hunting or whatever it is that you do drugs any of that you know fucking netflix and cuddles wherever it is that you go whatever your citadel is those walls are down and yeah ayahuasca is coming in with a huge fucking catapult and it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna annihilate it what about boredom because this is something that i think has been completely eroded obviously by the invention of the smartphone but that, yeah. that's a type of discomfort as well yeah so I started thinking about this because when we're up in the Arctic, we're hunting, right? And I think a lot of people think that hunting is like this action-packed thing. It's not. It's a lot of waiting. It's, like yeah, it's, a, wait, it's waiting. That's what it's it is. It's a lot of waiting because we're hunting caribou as they're migrating, right? So we're sitting on these hills waiting for these animals to come through, and they're not coming through. We're like all day, right? So I didn't bring my cell phone. I didn't bring a computer. I didn't bring an iPad. I didn't bring a book. I didn't bring a magazine. I didn't bring all this stuff, right? So all of a sudden, I find myself bored again right just this like oh what the hell's this uh so we had to come up with creative ways to deal with our boredom right so we would read the labels on all the food we brought up you know we would read the label we would read the tags on our jacket so it was like oh this is coated in something called dermazac wow interesting <laughs> sounds like an acne medication right we would i, I did more push-ups than i'd ever done in my life because it's like oh, i guess i'll just do some push-ups what the hell else am i going to do uh, came up with a bunch of story ideas for the magazines I wrote for, wrote some of the book, did all this shit, came up with the Christmas list for all the people I know, like for the next five years. Right. So I basically told you that to say that, like, if I were at home, this is radically different than how I would have dealt with boredom because I would have just dove into a screen, whether that be my cell phone, whether that be Netflix, whatever. But when you think about boredom from an evolutionary context, it's essentially this evolutionary discomfort that told us whatever you are doing with your time right now, the return on your time invested has worn thin and you need to go do something else. It tells us to go do something else. So imagine that you and I are hunting and we, it's a million years ago, we actually need dinner, right? Or we're going to starve to death and die. Well, if the animal, animals weren't rolling through and we knew we weren't going to get anything, boredom would kick on and be like, man, yeah, well, you want to go pick some potatoes or something? Like that's a better use of our time, right? So it's this evolutionary discomfort that tells us to do something. And that's something that we used to do in our past was often productive and improved our lives. Nowadays, when it kicks on, we have easy, easy escapes from it. So I talked to this one neuroscientist that basically told me the way that we deal with boredom now is like junk foods for our mind, right? We just pull out our phone anytime we feel the lightest twinge of it. We're not forced to introspect and come up with something else to do. And this definitely has uh, consequences. So it's associated with all the, the rising rates of anxiety and burnout that people face. Why is that? Uh, so when you're, <clears throat> when you're focusing on the outside world, like on a screen, okay? And, and one thing that I'll add too is that the average person now spends 12 hours a day engaging with digital media. More than 12 hours a day. I mean, it's crazy amount of media, right? And this is all stuff that's 100 years, uh, at most 100 years old. So <clears throat> when you're focusing on the outward world, your brain is actually working really hard. It's a, it's a work state. When you have these moments where you have to go internally and you're sort of mind wandering, that's a rest state for your brain. So your brain sort of relaxes and revives. So nowadays we spend with all this media we take in, we spend so much time in that work state and so few time, so little time in that sort of rest state that our brain just becomes overworked. And it's just like way too much outward stimulation and focusing. So it seems to be that that is sort of what's driving a lot of like the burnout and just feeling like, Oh God, like mentally fatigued. Right. Whereas if we spend time bored, we're going to have this moment where we kind of go inward, we mind wander for a while, and eventually we spit out something to do. So boredom so is kind restorative of in a way. Restorative, yes, exactly. Um, it also increases creativity. So this is pretty interesting. Some of these studies I love are that uh, they will take two groups of people. They will let one group do whatever the hell they want. They'll put them in a room, and usually people just pull out their cell phone, right? and just start scrolling and do whatever. Then they'll take another group, and they will bore the living hell out of these people. 
And then they'll give them a creativity test. And the board group always comes up with more, more creative answers than the non-board group. And that's simply because their minds have had time to go internally, to rest, to sort of reset. And good ideas seem to come out of that. And then there's also the fact of like, you, you think about that William James quote. It's basically like your life is essentially a collection of that which you were aware of. Well, we're now aware of 12 hours of screen stuff every single day, right? So our life has effectively become Instagram, Netflix, whatever. Um, so when I talk about this, you hear the message of like, we need to spend less time on our phones a lot. And I think that's obvious. It's like, spend less time on your phone, spend less time on your phone. Yeah, everybody wants to do that. Everyone gets it. Uh, but the problem is, is that when people take, say, an hour off their phone screen time, they're now go, well, what the hell do I do now? I'm bored. And then they'll like go watch Netflix, right? Well, your brain does not know the difference between those two things. So I advocate for thinking more boredom. And the way that I work that into my life is I just make sure I have 20 minutes every day, maybe go outside, take a walk where I'm just completely disconnected. I just let my brain go wherever the hell it needs to go. One of the things that I find, man, when I go for a walk now, I do daily when I wake up and then usually uh, in an afternoon, so I probably accumulate 45 minutes ish of walking per day my brain especially if it's after a, a pretty intense period of either learning or researching or working or whatever i have more than enough stuff going on in my brain to keep me entertained for 45 minutes of walking like there is boredom there but there's so much bouncing around that i don't really get to the stage where i think oh, fucking you got nothing to think about it's like whoa, whoa whoa no 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 no. the volume was really really high and now it's just a little bit lower um and you probably figure some things out so you think about like people always talk about where do you have your best ideas you have them in the shower right dude, that's, that's a cliche. let me tell let me give you the fucking life hack of the century for this so there is a thing called a shower notepad so it's waterproof paper with waterproof pencils and we've got one of them in the shower upstairs and it's a two different colored pencils. Now, the problem is that I live with two of the lads, so we just write abuse to each other in different types of pencils. <laughs> so it's just like co That's comments awesome. comments on the fact that one of us has gained weight or comments on the fact that somebody left some fucking dishes out last night or whatever. Uh, however, the, the purpose of it is that if you have an idea in the shower that you're supposed to write That's them down awesome. and get them on Amazon. I like it. Yeah, well, the reason that we do have ideas in the shower is because it's this time that we're like totally unstimulated and we're just like our minds kind of go in weird places. And it, you tend to find that people, you know, they they think on an idea for a while, they'll be working on a project and the idea will spontaneously kind of arrive, like the solution will spontaneously arrive at some later point when your brain just has a while to sort of process things in the background. Have you ever been meditating and come out of a meditation session with a to-do list of things that you've thought of during the meditation session? And you're like, right, yeah. so, so I need to ring mum because I need to let her know about this and I need to tell my assistant about that thing and I've got that, that I've got to buy the insurance for the car because the car going to get... You're like, fucking yep. hell, like that wasn't the purpose of this <laughs> meditation session. But alas, look at me with this fucking to-do list. Here we are, yep. Is that related? Is the boredom thing related to how quickly we perceive time and our, our lives going past, do you think? Yeah, for sure. Well, this is really related to um, new experiences. So <clears throat> we also evolved to slip into predictable routines, right? Just kind of do the same thing over and over. And the reason for this is that gave us, again, gave us a survival advantage. If we could predict where we would find food, if we could predict you know, where our shelter would be, on and on and on. If we ha had this sort of habitual routine every day, uh, we'd be more likely to survive. Now, we still have that quirk uh, in our modern life. But in modern life, we're not really worried about survival, right? <laughs> and what happens when you've done the same thing over and over and over? Uh, your brain sort of goes into this autopilot mode. Where you don't really have to be present and aware. You're sort of just going through the motions. And that seems to be associated with time um, going by faster. So you think about when you were a kid, right? Everything seemed to take so much longer. Well, it's because everything was new and you were constantly learning. So sort of the takeaway there is that learning and doing new things um, is kind of like a, a wake up almost, right? It's like you're forced into presence and awareness because you don't know how to do the thing and it can slow down time, your perception of time, which is pretty cool. Bro, you fucking nailed it. 
you absolutely nailed it. I've been thinking about this for so long. I put a tweet out the other day that said, um, life doesn't go past any quicker as you get older. You're just paying less attention. And I got a load of replies from people that were adamant that, no, well, it's because one year when you're one year old means that that's 100% of your life. And one year when you're 50 years old is one 50th of your life. Okay, that's true. But you're not absorbing your entirety of existence all at the same time. That's not how life works. The reason that your life appears to move quicker is that you no longer have a learner's mind. You are simply paying less attention. What people mean when they say life seems to be moving so fast, where did the days go, is I don't remember where the days went. Like People spend fucking months on end doing nothing memorable with their time and then complain that they can't remember it. It's like, bro, you're making your days forgettable. You're not yeah. doing anything that is worthy of your mind remembering it. You drive the same route to work, to and from work. That's a thousand journeys maybe that you've made over the last couple of years. They've all been condensed down into one memory. Think about the last time that you went away on holiday. The two, here's the two things. The two things that I've learned on my research that you want, if you want to slow your life down, a novelty and intensity. Those are the two things that you can manipulate most effectively. So think about the last time that you went away on holiday and think about not who you were sat next to on the plane because you've done plane journeys before, but if it was a new airport where you arrived and the person that greeted you at immigration and the taxi driver that picked you up outside. And the dude, I went to Africa five and a bit years ago and i remember the book that the guy who met us at reception carried under his arm as we walked down i remember the way that his shoes look i remember the uh, the favorite bird that he had from the local environment i remember his name dennis it was like a given name he was he was like rwandan he definitely wasn't called dennis um i remember all of that why well, i can't remember the 16 digit number off the front of my fucking credit card that i've had for four years why is it that i can remember dennis and his shoes and his book and his favorite bird novelty and intensity yeah. that is the way to slow down life so for the people and this is you know it's a mem- reminder for me as well i i get pissed that it's the same it's your routine that's causing that to happen vary the things that you do and vary the route that you drive to work. It sounds so dumb, but like vary the route that you drive to work, vary where you sit in the coffee shop that you go to every day. You know, say something different to someone, go up and speak to somebody. The more that you do that, the slower that life is going to exist. And really the goal of life, as far as I can see it, is to live a life that in retrospect, you're glad you lived. Very much of our existence is actually lived looking backward at the days that we've had because the present moment is fleeting. The present moment exists now and now, and now, and now, and now. It never exists for a prolonged period of time, but memories last forever. So the way that you can see your existence is basically that every single moment that you live can be a gift to the future version of you to look back on with pleasure. Yeah, exactly. And I think this phenomenon also explains why you have people report that time has seemed to go by super fast during COVID. People are like, oh God, that like we're in 2022. How did that happen? It feels like it's been a month. Well, it's because we've all been sitting in our houses the last two years and like haven't gone out as much, haven't, you know, gone to concerts, haven't gone to restaurants, like just haven't done any new stuff. I haven't been traveling, haven't done a lot of stuff stuff. Where should people start with this discomfort stuff? What what habits have you used in your life that are useful for creating a, a routine out of this? Yeah. So I kind of like lay out a whole sort of action plan in the book inherently. And it's, um, but I think that doing one really hard thing a year, like I talked about, um, more time outside, I talk about really the benefits of that. And there's these different like doses and kinds of nature that we need to add back into our life. I think the boredom thing is huge. Um, in the book I talk about, uh, I get a lot into, uh, nutrition and talk about how hunger is like so important. It's this like, discomfort you're going to have to go through, right? Um, I also talk about the benefits of carrying heavy things as a form of exercise that have, we've essentially Liver engineered King. out of our Liver lives. Liver King's got that. Fucking speak to him about it. Speak to Brian Johnson about it. There Liver, we go. Liver King's <laughs> carrying all sorts of shit. Yeah, and uh, and on and on. I mean, there's a bunch I, I mentioned in the book for sure. Yeah, one of the things that he does, fucking the Liver King podcast here, one of the things that he does is he purposefully creates a uh physiological hunt before he breaks a fast have you seen this that he does i haven't now so he'll do a workout uh that finishes with a carry prior to breaking a fast and 
say what you want about him, but that is a really smart way to replicate evolutionarily what we would have done. Yeah, Chase something down, a little bit of a workout, some monostructural stuff. Maybe he's on a, a assault bike or a rower or something like that. And then he'll do a heavy carry at the end of his <laughs> workout. And you think, I don't know if you can physiologically replicate that in a more convenient way or if it really, really matters too much. But if you want to get close to what you were doing, doing some monostructural cardio for maybe, you know, an hour and then carrying a heavy thing for half a mile or a mile is probably a pretty fucking good way to replicate it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I will say that he's probably a hundred pounds more than humans would have been in the past. But <laughs> <laughs> Imagine okay. if people will look, look like It's funny him. because like the paleo community pictures hunter gathers as like these jacked people. It's like, dude, they weigh like a hundred pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were distance runners. They were endurance athletes. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but that's cool though. I love, I love, um, the creativity and thinking about like, I mean, it's all, it's all interesting and like, it's ultimately going to benefit your life. So super cool. Michael Easter, ladies and gentlemen, the comfort crisis, embrace discomfort to reclaim your wild, happy, healthy self will be linked in the show notes below. What else should people follow if they want to keep up to date with the stuff you do? I'm on Instagram at Michael underscore Easter. I got a website, Easter Michael, and there's a link there to a newsletter if you want to keep up with that. And yeah, I'm easy to find. I mean, Google's a thing. You can find me there. Dope. Thanks, mate. Hey, thank you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.